close our eyes and let's just have a prayer. Father in heaven, again, we thank you for the master plan that was initiated long before the creation of our world. Thank you, Father in heaven, that you and those who belong to the Godhead sat together and considered the possibility that one day somebody would fall away from your law. And you prepared a plan, something that you knew would be so effective that even those who have fallen from grace would be able to be saved by grace. So tonight as we look at your word and as we try to understand this magnificent plan, Father, may our hearts be drawn to you. May we long to meet you face to face and just to praise you for making it possible that we can be called your sons and daughters. Holy Spirit, as always, please guide us. We would love to <coughs> see between the lines. So please give us eye salt so that we can see. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, dear friends, to get us going, I'd like you to go with me to 1 John chapter 5, and I would like us to look at verse 11. 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 11. It says there, And this is the testimony God has given us eternal life. So listen to this. If you jump back a little bit, it says there that in verse 9, we accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. So what we see here is what I want your attention to be drawn to. If you look again at verse 11, it says that this is God's testimony. And the testimony that God is going to give us is that He, God, has given us eternal life. The Father here has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. So, when I looked at this verse, and I think of that instance there with a rich young man, when... He had left. He wasn't willing to sell what he had. And as he left, Christ turned to the disciples and said, and I'm paraphrasing slightly here, that it would be harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it would be for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And that was quite shocking. I mean, if you just consider that, as much as we like to talk about the needle being kind of a gateway, I would like you just to consider for a moment that if it was a needle, it's impossible for a camel to even go through there. And yet, it would be harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it would be for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. And Peter responds to this. He's overwhelmed and he's always the one that speaks his heart. And he says, who will be able to stand? Who will be able to be saved? And then we have those powerful words of Christ. Where Christ turns to Peter and says, what is impossible for man with God, all things are possible. And dear friends, I want you just to consider this. Right from the fall, from Adam and Eve, there has been this drive because we've been called to do that, to strive towards holiness, to strive towards purity. And sometimes we pat ourselves on the back and we feel that we've accomplished certain things when we've managed to get those things that used to entangle us under our feet. 
But I think that most of us, when we sit quietly in our inner rooms, thinking about our lives, we see that many times we speak with forked tongues. We talk as one who are victorious, but we find ourselves sometimes weeping in our corners because of our shortcomings. Like Paul, we recognize our wretchedness and um, how that we delight in the law. We know that it is honorable, just and good, holy, just and good, and yet we find ourselves unable to attain to its righteousness. Yet I'm clearly counseled also in God's word that one day when Jesus comes back to fetch us, the unrighteous will not enter the kingdom of God. Only those who have white robes, which is a display of righteousness, will be the ones who will be allowed to the, the banquet table in God's kingdom. So when I think of this and I'm like Peter, overwhelmed because you perhaps get certain people in gradients as far as salvation is concerned. And some people have seemed to have attained to a higher salvation. But even that person will fall terribly short of the expectations of God. And so the father looks at this and he recognizes that something has to be done on behalf of man. God has to do something. And so they sit down in council and they devise a plan. Now this plan, um, just briefly jump with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Keeping your finger there in 1 John chapter 5 because I'm going back. We find from verse 3 on where Paul indicates something that's very important. He says in verse 3, Praise be to the God, and then he defines which part of the God he is talking about, which person. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. So it is God who has blessed us in the heavenly realms, with every spiritual blessing in Christ. It's almost those words where it says that in Christ, all the promises of God that he had made to mankind is yes, in Christ. Here we see that, that God has blessed us in the heavenly realms with all the spiritual blessings in Christ. Then it says this, verse 4, For he, that is the Father, chose us in him that's in Christ before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. So I want you just to look at this, not blameless within the eyes of the world, but to be blameless in God's eyes. And so God devised a plan in which we, the fallen sinner, could stand blameless in his presence. Notice it's something that he does. And then it goes on. And it says in verse, um, uh, the last part of verse uh, 4, <coughs> going on to verse 5, it says, In love he predestined as for adoption to sonship, through Jesus Christ. And then it says this. In accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace. Which he has freely given to us in the one he loves. Now remember the one that he loves is Jesus Christ. Remember as he came out, out of the baptismal waters there in the river Jordan. A voice from heaven said this is my beloved son. In whom I am well pleased. And it's so interesting that when you look at this, it was the father's delight to see his son take on human form. Because when he took on human form, the plan was initiated. 
This plan that mankind could never achieve, and that was to stand in his presence blameless, without sin. But that he had planned something, and what was impossible for man to attain, God, through his glorious power in Christ, gets us to stand blameless in his presence. So look at this. The plan of salvation is, is not about us and our attempt to try and be holy as the Father is holy. But it's about the gift. So let's go back to 1 John chapter 5. And I want you to listen again to verse 9. We accept human testimony. But God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God which he has given about his son. So what is this? <coughs> Sorry, dear friends. What is this that he has given about his son? It says in verse 10, Whoever believes in the Son of God accepts his testimony. Whoever does not believe God has made him out to be a liar because they have not believed the testimony of God has given about his son. What is the testimony that God has given about his son? Verse 11. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. And this life is in his son. So when you look at this, God has already satisfied the claims of his law. God has already made it possible for fallen man to stand in his presence by grace because of what his son has done for us. His son took on human form and he was in all points tempted like as we are. Um, I'd like you just to emphasize this point and to do that, I'd like to take you to 2 Corinthians and I would like you to look at chapter 5 with me. To 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and I'd like you to look at the very last verse that we read there. So 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and we're going to be reading verse 21. God made him, this is Jesus, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Listen to that. You see, this plan of God was to be put into effect, and the plan was so powerful that a fallen person who found himself bound in wickedness by accepting Christ could stand before the Father pure as if he had never sinned, holy before the Father. Because Christ, this was part of the plan, that Christ would take upon himself that sin, that fallen person, and that he would take the place of that person and die that sinner's death. And that at his resurrection, the plan was stamped and given the approval of the father. Because the father called his son. And we hear this through the angel. Son of God, thy father calls thee. And we have this incredible parade, this ascension parade into the presence of the father. With the angel singing. And then we read in Matthew of a certain group of people who at the resurrection of Christ also rose with him. And those were the first fruits of those who had fallen asleep in Christ. Those who had accepted Christ. Those who had found their rest in Christ. You see, dear friends, what I'm trying to explain to you here is this. The Father is already satisfied. Not because of something we have done. We have not satisfied him. But the father has been satisfied through the plan that they put into effect. And that is that one of the persons of the Godhead, which was the son of God, came down, took our place, 
lived the life that we should have lived, the life, right, life of righteousness. He died the death that we should have died. And he rose to give us the, the indication that those who believe in him, who accept, as it says there in, in um, 1 John, sorry, 2, 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 again, that if we have Christ, let's just go there. 1 John chapter 5, verse 11. It says there, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. You see, we didn't earn it. He has given us eternal life. And this eternal life is embodied in His Son. As it says there, and this eternal life, this life is in His Son. Then it says these words in verse 12. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Dear friends, I want you to listen to that. You can be the strictest law-abiding person. You can be like that rich young man, seemingly without fault. But unless you have Christ, you do not have eternal life. And so the important thing here that I want you to see is that God had a plan. This eternal plan of salvation. And this eternal plan of salvation, as we read there in Ephesians, was established long before the creation of our world. And the interesting thing is, the whole hope of salvation rests in this, that you believe the testimony of God. You see, God says that my son holds within himself eternal life. That's God's testimony. And as it says there, God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. So what I want us to first get right, before we can even talk about a holy life, is to recognize the plan. This plan of being pure before the Father. This plan about being justified before the Father. This plan about seeming to be a person who has never fallen. This plan is found in Jesus Christ. Now what I want you to also recognize here, which is so important, that the acceptance of this plan is to then recognize the importance of Holding on to it. If you have Christ, you have life. If you do not have Christ, you do not have life. So what you have to really hold on to is Christ. Like Jacob, you've almost got to say, I will not let you go until you bless me. It's to recognize that in Christ is our hope. <coughs> and... Christ in you is that hope of glory. Holding on to Christ. When he knocks at your door, you open up your heart. You allow him in. And then anything that offends him, that does not make him feel comfortable for being with you, you would set aside all of that. You will confess it before him. You will ask for forgiveness. You will turn from those thoughts. And then you will allow him <coughs> to remove that sin as far as the east is from the west from you. 
and that you will allow him to cleanse you. Now with Jesus inside, when he starts the cleansing work, he starts it inside. And as the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will speak. If he has cleaned your heart, the righteous acts will be visible. So what I want to end off with is just to remind you that God has given us his testimony. And our eternal life depends on our acceptance of his testimony. If we do not accept his testimony, as it has been said, then we make him out to be a liar. If we do not believe that in Christ is embodied eternal life, which the Father has told us, then we make him out to be a liar. And that kind of person will not experience eternal life. So I would like you to bear in mind that you cannot be saved without Christ. That is God's plan for you to be able to stand in his presence, holy and pure and as a child of his. Thank you.